Hello, thank you for joining us today for today's webinar session, Guiding Companies Through Organizational Maturity. And we have here myself, Janice Parson, and my co-presenter, Alice Ann Allen. So to provide a brief introduction, again, I'm Janice Parson, VP within RGP's Consulting Services team. And I lead a number of cross-functional initiatives within finance, accounting, and risk and compliance. And my background is primarily within the having to have reporting strategies, development of new solutions, as well as driving continuous improvement for companies. And a little bit about RGP. RGP is a global consulting company that serves over 2,400 clients, which includes three-fourths of the Fortune 500. RGP enables rapid business outcomes by bringing together the right people who together create transformative change. Alisan, can you provide a brief introduction as well? Sure, happy to do that. So Alisan Gilmore Allen based in Silicon Valley. Uh, I am have been involved in the world of internal audit and control since uh, seven plus years of big four experience at Deloitte and then built building and operating the internal audit department and function at a couple of technology companies located here in Silicon Valley. <clears throat> At RGP, my role is an engagement leader where I am leading internal audit and SOX engagements, as well as assisting and facilitating fraud risk assessments, enterprise risk assessments, and other operational audit type activities. I'm glad to be here and presenting to you all today. Great. Thank you, Alisan. So on our today's agenda, what we'd like to talk about is uh, internal control, as well as organizational maturity. Um, we also like to be able to talk about building your internal audit function, with which um, Alisan will talk through a client scenario, um, and then provide uh, a recap in terms of what we talked about. But before we do that, we'd like to start our first polling question, and I will uh, uh, speak to that um, right here, which is, which organizational function do you currently represent? Is it finance? internal audit, legal, audit committee member or board or other. So we'll just give a, um, about 15 seconds for you to answer and respond. All right, great. So we have a large percentage of you representing internal audit and uh, a few in finance um, or about a quarter in finance. So. Great, thank you. All right. So uh, what I like to first kick off with is having to talk about internal controls um, and then dive a little bit into organizational maturity. So as organizations transform from compliance to internal audit, you know, really one of the core aspects to this is having internal controls in place as the underlying foundation. And so because, because of this, I like to first talk about um, internal controls and the significance of internal controls, starting with the regulatory landscape. Excuse me. So SOX has been enacted for quite some time, um, starting back in 2002, and really triggered from the financial scandals in the early 2000s. And everybody's heard of Enron, whether during their career or in school as a case study in terms of what the financial corruption may lead to. And as a result, Sarbanes-Oxley was created to have management take on the responsibility for accurate financial statements and have internal controls in place to support it. But interesting enough, um, Canada and Japan followed suit soon after um, SOX was enacted. The Canadian government passed Bill 198 its own version of SOX in 2003 and frequently referred to as CSOX. And the Japan government passed the Financial Instrument and Exchange Act in 2007, frequently referred to as the JSOX. And both have similar measures and concept um, with some of the different elements, but ultimately the goal for all is to inform the marketplace that management is to take the responsibility to have internal controls in place over financial reporting. Now recently, the UK government is also proposing a similar approach in the foreseeable future. 
The Department for Business and Energy and Strategy had issued a report to propose strengthening the UK's framework on how companies are audited and proposed measures like the US SOX. Although the parliament is currently evaluating, UK companies should start initiating a head start and begin planning since implementation would take some time um, in having to address the requirements. Now, as mentioned earlier, SOX has been enacted for some time and along with this are US regulatory bodies who either monitor the companies that register with the public stock exchange or the financial auditors of these companies. And I'd like to first share some perspectives from the SEC who monitors the companies that register with the public stock exchange and on the significance of internal controls over financial reporting. Now the SEC has multiple divisions and when what you might typically observe or see is where the SEC's Division of Corporate Finance issues comment letters to the company registrants. And it's mainly regarding its filing disclosures when the SEC has compliance concerns. But depending on the situation, the SEC may also conduct further investigations. And this is an interesting case I like to highlight since specifically it's relating to the significance of internal controls and what occurred when there's a lack of. This case was handled by the SEC's Division of Enforcement, which conducts investigations into possible violations of the federal security laws and prosecutes the SEC's civil suits in the federal court. Candy's inventory tracking system was incapable of supporting its disclosed inventory accounting methodology because it didn't have proper um, historical costs from a system populated. And the data from the system populated Tandy's financial statements with inaccurate financial data. So as a result, the SEC had charged the retailer and the former CEO for audit and control failures. And as well as um, the company was fined and the former CEO was also fined for violating the 302 certification provisions. And then this also led to the restatement of the financials for 2017 through 2019. So pretty significant impact uh, with the lack of internal controls in place. Now with the impact of technology, from a regulatory perspective and as standards have evolved, management and the financial auditors are required to emphasize on the completeness and the accuracy of supporting evidence. But at times, the multi-step task really may involve a combination of systems and spreadsheets, and this really becomes harder to validate. This is also where we see emerging trends in technology applied to internal controls or an audit procedure to improve operational efficiency as well as audibility and a stronger control activity as a result. Here, I'd like to share some perspective from the PCAOB, which oversees the audits of the public companies and the SEC registered broker dealers. The PCOB has recognized the increasing use of technology by auditors and sees the benefits in the use of technology to address a few aspects of the audit process. So unpredictability. Technology aids the auditor in identifying transactions outside of the traditional selection criteria. Audit procedures. Technology can help recalibrate the procedures to adjust to the planned audit response of the client scenario. The risk of material misstatements. It can reduce risk by performing multiple iterations of a test, conduct more efficient testing, or minimize the risk by assessing the full coverage of the data received. On the other hand, when auditors leverage technology or is dependent on technology to audit the source information, it's important to evaluate the source information appropriately. 
confirming the completeness and the accuracy of information provided by the entity, or typically referred to as IPE, continues to be a key topic and an ICFR observation for the PCAOB. This is also evident in prior PCAOB observation reports, such as the report pertaining to the revenue and related accounts in 2020. Now, in terms of emerging technologies, examples of, of that may include bots, RPAs, and artificial intelligence. And part of the controls may be automation of accounts receivable reconciliation or an execution of business controls. It can be control testing, performing data quality checks or pre-fill audit work papers with specified metrics. And then there's continuous monitoring. The ability to increase the risk coverage, evaluate the full population, and gain efficiency. An example may be establishing possible elements to flag and monitor for, let's say, an expense subledger system, such as systematically identifying non-meal expenses that were incorrectly categorized as meals for evaluation. Now, having strong internal controls in place can also make a significant impact to deter fraud. I'd like to share some recent research from the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. And the source is Occupational Fraud 2022, a report to the nations. This is research and analysis conducted from occupational fraud schemes derived from more than 2,000 real cases of fraud and affecting organizations in a number of countries and in multiple industries. Now, from the report, internal audit is the second most frequent source of how occupational fraud are initially detected, along with the tips in terms of um, the largest or the top source. And what are the primary internal control weaknesses that contribute to occupational fraud? Key weaknesses are the lack of internal controls or the ability to override controls. Now there are other weaknesses which include the lack of management review or tone on the top, the lack of competent personnel and oversight roles following suit. And then interesting enough, owners and executives committed only about a fourth of the occupational fraud that they caused the largest losses. So again, I want to emphasize that having strong internal controls in place can really make a significant impact to deter fraud as well. And as a company grows, it goes through a transformation process from establishing the foundations of reporting and governance to creating value through risk management, optimization, and deeper insights. And within the organization, these are critical areas. Now I'd like to talk about organizational maturity and dis discuss a little bit um, in terms of that process. For risk and compliance transformation, it is from establishing the corporate governance and control design, such as when you're a startup or, or prior to IPO, to mitigating the risk through testing and remediation to meet the compliance needs, and expanding to other internal audit needs to mitigate the risk within business operations. And where internal, internal audit function can add further value besides mitigating a company's risk is to be able to provide that independent, unbiased opinion to the organization. <clears throat> so I mentioned about how a company may transform as it grows and matures. And so many its risk management functions as well as the ownership responsibilities. A mature risk management process can demonstrate benefits 
by having to facilitate the risk-based decision-making and strategy planning. I want to illustrate a maturity model example here that the Institute and internal auditors have shared previously in the practice phase. And before we dive deeper in each phase, I do want to emphasize that this is, it's not really optimal or practical for all organizations to be operating at the highest level of maturity at Optimize. <clears throat> and many organizations achieve at repeatable or defined phase, and it's completely acceptable. Each organization should determine which level of maturity is optimal for its circumstances. Now, for this specific example risk management model, the illustration is more around the roles and responsibilities across the organization. And that's what I like to speak about today. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in the initial phase, the internal audit activity is likely to be more involved and would be when the process is more mature. And the risk management activities may rely more on internal audit risk assessments, as well as the risk-based assurance and advice. This is the early onset of program establishment to address what may be initially mandated or required, such as establishing control structure to meet SOX requirements. In the repeatable phase, the internal audit activity is likely better organized and resourced and plays an instrumental role by performing risk-based assessments. The internal audit activity may work along with compliance, legal, and internal quality assurance functions, adding internal audit expertise to assist the risk owners in line and operational management functions to build and monitor operational controls. This stage, <clears throat> this stage is enough for many organizations if the process is operating efficiently, consistently. Defined, organizations that fall in the middle of the model may have a mixture of maturity levels. There may be some business unit operating at a higher level of maturity than others, and in this stage, the organization's compliance, legal, or internal quality assurance functions may begin to own the risk management processes and have responsibilities that remain consistently within the managed and the op optimized levels. Now, the compliance or the internal audit, I'm sorry, compliance or the internal quality assurance functions may play an active role in assisting line and operational management to assist and assess the risk and perform other risk management activities. Examples may be risk where it may be tied to the objectives of a department or a project team and start being considered or governed by senior management or other board members. I've seen this in the security risk management approach this way. In terms of the managed phase, in organizations that have achieved a significant level of maturity, line or operational management owns and manages the risk organization wide and is responsible for implementing corrective actions to address process and control activities. <clears throat> this internal audit activity may act primarily as an independent assurance function assessing the effectiveness of the risk management process. This can lead to where management compensation or the incentives may be linked to key performance indicators and driven and identified through risk. Now optimize, in this stage, the line and operational management owns the risk management process. The organization's compliance or other uh, risk management functions conduct risk assessments for their own use. They may also monitor the risk assessments and reporting produced by the line and operational management. 
and may re reevaluate or assess the risk information as necessary. The risks are monitored and managed across various business operations. Now, this is just an illustration. So, illustrating here the maturity model in practice, I like to call out two things. These layers may be at differing stages of maturity and that the risk management activities can facilitate the planning for the internal audit function. Now, it's difficult to say that an organization in a specific phase, when there are multiple elements or layers to risk management, affecting different parts of the business, from compliance to operations. This is where it is possible to have a more mature compliance program, such as the SOX controls and compliance, and a less mature risk management process within the organization. And this is what I'm illustrating here, where, for example, there may be a client where the client's SOX compliance program is at the defined stage because it has gone through multiple iterations and have improved through time, but then its risk management program is being developed further and is currently at the repeatable stage. It's also important to understand that establishing a repeatable cadence to evaluate enterprise risk can help set a solid foundation and direction to plan for internal audit and provide opportunities to engage operational process owners to participate in the risk mitigation efforts. Now, in this next segment, Alison will walk you through the client scenario and discuss how the client's internal audit function have involved, has evolved and matured. But before we do that, we have our next polling question. What is the current stage of maturity of the risk management function for your organization or at your primary client? Is it at initial, repeatable, defined, managed, or optimized? And we'll give you about 15 seconds to, or so to answer. And that'd be great. And I'd be interested in seeing this uh, result as well after talking about organizational maturity. All right. So we have uh, a third of you responded with defined, and then a third of you responded with manage. And then about um, a fifth of you responded with repeatable. So, it's a great audience here. We have a, a little bit of spread out in terms of where they're currently at. Okay, thank you for that. And Alice Ann, I'll turn it to you. Well, thank you, uh, Janice, appreciate that. And uh, glad to be sharing an example with you of building the internal audit function. Um, we've got a client example uh, that we're gonna move forward with. So before we go into the details, um, just want to let you know, this is a little benchmarking information. This is um, from the Institute of Internal Auditors. And through that organization, as you may or may not know, you're able to get benchmarking information that you can compare the size of your organization and the revenues of your organization to what would be a typical internal audit function. So the population is, is merely the number of organizations that have cho chosen to respond to the IIA survey, but it gives you an example of sort of size um, and revenue of the typical internal audit function. So my case study example is on a healthcare company. Uh, so that's what we were comparing to here. And you can see within the IIA survey, they had 16 organizations that had revenues under 500 million, 21, uh, 500 to a billion, and then the healthcare companies, they had nine. And among those, you can see the uh, employee sizes um, and then the internal audit staff count. So it's actually not that different here, but you know, sort of five to eight, nine people within these size companies uh, based on those that filled the survey. Now there's a lot of 
organizations that had a very large internal audit functions. You think about banks and financial institutions, and they might have hundreds of people within their internal audit function. On the smaller end would be, you know, startups, tech companies, those kinds of things that tend to start very small with their internal audit function. And then you can see typically, you know, internal audit costs here um, as compared to external audit fees and then the um, external auditor fees as a percent of revenue. So anyway, um, just wanted to share that just to give you a little bit of a flavor. So internal audit functions often have, you know, at least five people, even if you're under $500 million uh, type organization. Why don't you move to the next slide, please? So in our particular company that we're going to talk about today, um, just to give you a little more detail, they've got, uh, it's, it's a global organization. Uh, they've got $300 million in global net sales, a couple of different uh, technologies in their um, product line. Uh, they consolidate their results. It's a fairly complex organization. And and this company is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And so um, by definition and requirement, New York Stock Exchange companies are required to have an internal audit function, as you likely know. If you're on the NASDAQ, it's not required, but it is recommended. So, you know, that's one thing to just be thinking about when companies are going public is on which exchange are you going to go public on? And then that would uh, dictate some of your requirements. In this particular case, uh, the internal audit function for my cl uh, client is fully outsourced to RGP. The CFO is our sponsor. And, and the reason that we are doing this work for them is that um, it's a very tight resource market, as you probably know, based on your own experiences. And they've had some resource turnover here. So we had helped them initially in terms of putting controls in place. And then they hired a head of internal audit who was there for a few years. And when she moved on, um, it was difficult to replace. And so they engaged us to, to fully manage the function for them. Our current activity mix for this company is about 60% SOX compliance and about 40% internal audit services. And in terms of building and running the IA function, if internal audit is going to have SOX, which you know over the long term, you know SOX is often a, considered a management function where internal audit would do the objective testing that would need to be done to support the uh, external auditor attestation. But um, oftentimes, you want to move the internal audit function to be less SOX based and more other operational internal audit services that can be value added to your organization. Should go to the next slide, please. So this just in our particular timeline, um, the company I'm speaking about went public back in 2014. Uh, they engaged um, RGP, previously actually a Creative Solutions, to help them develop their SOX program, given the IPO had already occurred. And then, as I noted, they hired their head of internal audit, and we continued to have a long-term partnership with that organization and help them with additional arms and legs to be able to you know, perform, support the testing work, that kind of thing. We initiated annual fraud and enterprise risk assessments. Um, <clears throat> the head of internal audit resigned in 2019, and that's when we uh, assumed the chief audit executive role and function, internal audit function for the company. And so we continue to <clears throat> initiate um, you know, advisory, internal audit advisory service operational audits each year and, and in the process of putting in continuous auditing uh, and monitoring and over the longer term uh, robotic process automation type activities here. So go ahead, please. Next slide. Okay, so before we get into further details, um, just want to get a handle on what category your organization or primary client belongs in. Is your company uh, or primary client revenues under 500 million, 500 million to a billion, or revenues uh, greater than a billion, or may maybe this doesn't apply to you. So I'll give you just a couple minutes to answer that question. <clears throat> like the votes are in. We have no super small companies among our audience today, but uh, it looks like about half have revenues between 500 million and a billion, uh, a third about revenues greater than a billion, and then a couple, 20%, it's not applicable yet at this point. So great. Well, thank you for that. So it's nice to know we're in the, the mid-sized companies and moving bigger. Next slide, please. So this, this slide is just to give you a little bit of a background and a flavor of the enterprise risk assessment uh, roadmap. And this is where, you know, many companies and, you know, we definitely help facilitate companies that want to do an enterprise risk assessment and really 
<coughs> identify what are the top risks that the company should be aware of. This is something that you know, boards and audit committees are increasingly asking about because they really want to know that management has got their focus on the areas of the greatest potential risk to the organization. Um, and so together we work with management um, to review what are the typical risks for a company of the size and stature. Um, this is through, you know, looking at, you know, the company's own documentation, uh, their K's and their Q's and their financial documents, as well as, you know, what's typical industry risks for companies in this sector, and then interviewing the execs and understand the audit committee or the board members and understanding what they believe are the biggest risks to the company, and then analyzing those risks, prioritizing them. Um, <clears throat> often we'll do um, uh, survey and get management to indicate what they believe are the likelihood and the impact. And then also importantly, the company's readiness to address these potential risks in the organization. And then that helps the company understand, you know, what does management believe are the biggest areas of risk or concern that the company really needs to address um, as they're moving forward and, and trying to become, you know, more profitable, more competitive, you know, bring the products to market, that kind of thing, and also deal with regulatory challenges. So as you walk through, identify the risks and then management can develop the action plan and move on. Um, the next area that we help our clients is in the expanded uh, fraud risk assessments where you know, we've already spoken a little bit about the ACFE uh, survey and their report to the nations where they have a lot of information on you know, what types of frauds are in cover, uncovered at companies and the fraud risks. And there's a lot of data on that. Um, and it's you know, often where you might not expect. So we've got a process and a system and a methodology to help work through what are the common set of fraud risks uh, that most companies might have. And then you can evaluate them specifically at your company and determine, do you have risks in these areas? And if so, you know, do you have controls in place that might mitigate those risks? Now, the other piece that's super helpful here is to do some fraud brainstorming because many times you'll find that um, the, the typical fraud risks aren't necessarily the risks within your own organization. And so as you do fraud brainstorming, you may find um, that there are unusual situations within your company where, um, you know, it's, as I say, it's not on a common set of fraud risks. Like for example, people have access to certain information that they could do something with that might be unique to your particular environment. Um, but not something you know that is you know common across industries or across companies. So those types of things help you identify you know additional potential fraud risks to be able to identify and develop the right internal controls to address those. Uh, the other piece that this uh, expanded fraud risk assessment would take into account is looking at just the corruption perception um, for countries around the world and do you have greater fraud risks in some countries than others. And if you do have greater fraud risks in certain countries where you're do, doing business or your company's doing business, should you think about maybe not having certain activities take place in those countries? Or um, do you need to bolster up your FCPA, your Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, um, you know, efforts around an education and training about what is uh, corrupt practice and what do people need to do to prevent that from happening in certain countries. Because in the end, the company is responsible for the process and the internal controls around the world, whether it's done internally or you've got third parties that are also helping you. And so then together we can work with you to help implement or enhance procedures and processes to, to give you additional comfort that you've got the right set of controls in place to reduce your fraud risk. And some of these fraud risks may or may not be material to the financial statements, but absolutely uh, could be devastating to the business to have a large you know, fraud that was perpetrated just based on the PR, um, public relations, you know, in, investor relations impacts, that kind of thing. So let's go ahead to the next slide, please. So also within our, our company, um, we looked at, you know, operational internal audit projects. Um, so we looked at the risk factors, the financial reporting risks, and you do your typical uh, financial risk assessment to figure out which areas are material to the financial statement. You've got the organizational risks um, at the enterprise level. You've got fraud risks, as we've talked about. You know, business model risks as the company is, you know, developing new systems or putting in new systems and new processes and changes and how should those systems and processes and, and enhancements, you know, be controlled. And then, you know, industry specific risks. So like within our healthcare organization, you've got individual healthcare data. So data privacy and, and just the whole HIPAA information 
uh, all of that needs to be tracked and managed. So you think about all of those um, risk factors and then identify, build an audit universe, identify the areas of key focus and risk, and then prioritize them and build the internal audit plan. So you know, operational audits in this case um, have been cybersecurity, just doing a basic hygiene audit to confirm that the company has the appropriate controls to you know, to address any sort of a cybersecurity incident, is there an opportunity to, um, in a process to escalate and make sure that the right people and the right processes get on this so that you don't have an unfettered risk here. Uh, data analytics is another area, and I'll go through that in a little bit more detail in the following slide. I'm just looking at key policies and are people aware of, you know, the code of conduct and the insider trading policy and the things that, you know, they may sign off on the code of conduct when they come on board or hopefully every year, um, but do they really know and understand what's in there and would they know where to go if they saw a problem or if they felt like they needed to submit a whistleblower complaint? So you can just do some general, you know, get a pulse on the business um, with surveys on are the people aware. And sometimes we found that, for example, at our, our company, um, that people close to headquarters are well aware of the policies and the controls, but as you get farther, farther and farther away from HQ, they don't have the same le level of visibility or understanding of where to go and how to get that type of information. Um, new system internal controls as systems are put in place, you wanna make sure that it's a whole lot easier to put the controls in place um, prior to go live than you know, after you put in a system and then you have to figure out, okay, well, we should have thought about controls ahead of time. Maybe you're putting in Coupa and you've got, you know, purchase to pay process and that, you know, ideally would get integrated within your ERP and, and put some automated controls in place. But sometimes companies will go ahead and put that in and don't really think about, you know, what you know, how could it really operate most efficiently and most effectively? So, so with our company, we've been helping as they put in new systems to make sure that, you know, internal controls are, are appropriate to address that. Should you go ahead to the next slide? So this one um, is just a general, you know, operational internal audit type project approach. This is probably what you would expect if you've done internal audit work. And I know many of you have given your uh, roles and responsibilities. So, and this is true with any good project. I mean, you do step one is you're planning and just making sure that you've got the right scope and approach and you're identifying, you know, what are the key risks that you want to assess or address during your audit or your process? What's your timeline? What's your plan? When do you need to have your, your results put together? Is it an upcoming audit committee meeting or is there another triggering event, a system go live? Um, the documentation process, just in terms of, you know, your interviews, your risk assessments, what activities you do there, the testing, and that varies dramatically based on the project underway in terms of what level of testing do you do and validation. Is it more of an assessment of where a company is at a point in time from a maturity level basis, or is it really doing detailed testing around, you know, activities or processes or controls? And then writing up the report. And this one obviously um, is, is an important piece because this is really where we have the opportunity to share and communicate findings and issues as you might expect and, and allow management to really you know, react and confirm that yes, they agree that what was found during the audit is appropriate and then, and then wrap up um, in terms of the whole process wrap up, the report, uh, the survey to make sure that everything went well, to make sure that management responses have been incorporated and then determine if there's follow-up that would be appropriate over time um, if there were recommendations that came out of that audit. Would you go ahead, please? So this slide here gives a little bit of detail around AP and vendor data analytics. So looking at um, vendors, you know, every company is doing business with a lot of vendors and there's a lot of opportunity for issues within the vendor list, the vendor population, duplicate payments, that kind of thing. And so we've got a, a quick uh, vendor analysis assessment that we do working uh, to try to identify, you know, control weaknesses or gaps or potential fraudulent issues or even, you know, risk of related party transactions. So, you know, in terms of this process, we get insights into, um, you know, who are the vendors, who are the big vendors that the company does the most business with. And, you know, any best practices, um, are there duplicate vendors within your system? You know, many companies put in, you know, you've got A, T, and T, A period, T period, and T period, or America Telephone and Telegraph. You've got many companies, you know, may have matured over time or their names have changed, but your vendor database may have, you know, a lot of duplicate information or similar information in there. And, 
it increases the risk of getting you know duplicate or inappropriate payments made because you could make it to vendor A and vendor B thinking it's the same thing. It is the same company, but you might have paid them twice, kind of thing. So anyway, um, so we do a data quality review. We look at the master data. Um, and then look for duplicate records, uh, matching any other unusual type uh, situations. Uh, looking at vendor spend is also very interesting. We found situations where, you know, a vendor came in and initially we were the company was spending about you know two thousand dollars a month, and all of a sudden it bumped to ten thousand a month, and all of a sudden it bumped to a hundred thousand a month. This was actually not at this client I'm referring to, but a different client. And we started looking at that particular vendor and realized that there was something amiss here, and and whatnot. So we had to work with the company to address that particular situation. Um, related party relationships is, is the other one that comes out. It came out with this client as well as many of our clients where you discover that some of your vendors are, you know, directly related to or living with um, vendors, uh, customers, employees, you know, that kind of thing. And they may not have disclosed those related party relationships um, to the company. And so, you know, it just adds risk. It may not be fraudulent necessarily to have a related party relationship, but it might be something that should be disclosed because, um, you know, those types of related party relationships, if they're over a certain dollar threshold, uh, should be disclosed in your public filings. And so most companies do have within their code of conduct that, you know, while you may be able to have a related party relationship, it should be disclosed. And your internal policy is typically to disclose it to either the chief uh, legal counsel or the CFO or both, or there may be others within your organization. So those types of things do come out of these uh, AP assessments where you're matching, you know, telephone numbers, addresses, and that kind of thing. To go ahead to the next slide. Okay, I guess we're here at another polling question. Um, so for you, uh, we'd like to know what you would consider to be the higher priority for your organization or primary client as it relates to operational audit. And this is a place where it's multiple answers are possible. So if you were thinking, you know, what types of audit activities might be most helpful to your organization? Would you think vendor transactions and what's going on there? Or customer transactions? Um, do you have, you know, customers and customer analytics there? Uh, cybersecurity risks and, you know, do you your company have the right controls in place to mitigate a risk should it happen um, is it worth looking at the process for escalating issues that kind of thing the system implementations are they going smoothly and you know are they you know able to fully integrate those systems into your processes and controls or is there an opportunity for improvement there a supply chain many opportunities here in terms of your procurement process and your supply chain and vendors and vendor selection processes here or not applicable none of the above all right, looks like 75% of us think there's an opportunity for uh, cybersecurity. I think that's that's great. And that's probably what you would expect given the sensitivity and all the phishing attempts, especially with COVID going on and on. System implementations looks like it's the second one here with half, half of our audience uh, thinking there's an opportunity there. And then still opportunities within supply chain and potentially vendor transactions. So this is super helpful. Thank you for that. All right. So this slide here um, just shares a little bit for you um, an internal audit maturity timeline. So as Janice talked about a little bit earlier, you think about the enterprise risk process, you think about the SOX process levels of maturity, internal audit function also has various levels of maturity um, in terms of, you know, the initial just getting the function set up. And this, you know, this you set this function up, whether it's a public company or a private company, it, you know, as I mentioned, New York Stock Exchange organizations, public companies must have IA functions, but many private companies put them in just to try to reduce the risk of fraud and, and understand business process. So initial steps, um, establishing a vision, putting together an initial charter to show what the internal audit function might have access to information wise, um, you know, basic internal audit universe and basic tools might be put in place. And then as time goes on, um, putting in standardized risk measurements, formalizing processes, you might have your enterprise risk assessment is really, you know, informing your audit plan and that's done on a recurring annual or some regular basis. Um, and some companies are doing enterprise risk sort of real time and updating their internal audit plan, you know, quarter over quarter as the business changes or at least a couple times a year because planning it sometimes a year in advance in the world we live in is, is you know, it's going to be stale. 
um, defined internal audit. You've got real metrics. You've got an enhanced fraud risk assessment, operational audit type activities. And then as time goes on, moving towards the managed, uh, the advanced tools, operational audits. And those could be in, in whatever areas of risk that you believe the you know, internal audit functions are partnered with uh, outsourced or co-sourced um, partners could help you uh, get a better handle around, uh, you know, what are the risks in the areas and the opportunities for improvement there. And then, you know, in the long run, setting up your processes and controls with continuous auditing, continuous monitoring, robotic process automation here, internal audit decision to port activities, you know, QA, um, internal audit functions. Typically, if you're following IIA standards, should have a quality assurance review or assessment about every five years. Um, that is obviously subject to confirmation and approval from your audit committee or your board, uh, but it's typical and expected standards so that you can keep, keep that function devolving, evolving and developing. I think devolving is a new word, I've just created it. All right, go ahead to the next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the outcomes that have been achieved for my uh, healthcare client that we've been talking about in the data analytics area for them, we did discover related party re uh, relationships, we discovered some conflicts of interest and also some duplicate payments that required resolution and this is pretty common when we do this assessment to find these types of things. Um, fraud risk assessment, we uncovered some inappropriate access to some sensitive information, um, and we were able to educate the company on the, the CPI, the Corruption Perception Index, and where they were doing business in some new countries that had very high fraud risk, so what kind of uh, controls they should think about there. And then system development lifecycle um, during the system implementations, as I mentioned earlier, rather than waiting until after the fact and trying to band-aid those controls in or those processes and having to then sometimes step back or re-engineer some of the activities within your process. Um, other client examples that we've got, not for this particular company, but for others, would be um, looking at customer or AR analytics in terms of who, who is your customer base and you know what's going on there with the revenues and looking at the data and the numbers. Um, we've talked a little bit about project and system implementations already, special projects. Um, the continuous monitoring, um, we talked a little bit about that as well and just getting regular processes to, you know, continuous doesn't necessarily mean it's happening like all the time, but on the it could be like recurring. So every week, every month you look at, you know, processes or look at activities or look at you know, certain transactions and whatnot to make sure things are operating effectively. Uh, another one, uh, you know, in this area is looking at sort of third party uh, recovery audits where you've got, you know, you're doing business with third parties and are you getting all of the revenue if you've got royalty agreements or things like that? Are you getting all the revenue that you're entitled to? So, so we definitely uh, do some work with uh, several clients in that area. And then cybersecurity, you know, just even a basic hygiene audit where we look at, you know, as I mentioned earlier a little bit, um, do you have the right controls in place that if you were to have a breach within your company or if one of your customers or your vendors had a breach, do you have the right, does your company have the right processes and controls and notification, you know, in, in place to be able to make sure that that gets escalated to the right place. So for example, does your IT organization report into the disclosure committee every quarter to say, have there been any breaches? What's the magnitude of those? Do we need to disclose on them? Those types of things. So lots of opportunities there. Go ahead to the next slide, please. So I guess we're getting to the wrap up stage here. Um, so how does internal audit impact your organization? Sort of the comprehensive view, you know, across the board. You know, it impacts the uh, strategy um, and it can influence the strategy or the, and the other way around. The strategy can also influence, you know, what the internal audit function uh, should be focused on. Um, the structure, your goal is to address you know, your board expectations, organizational alignment, that kind of thing. Um, the people is really important, you know, just it's a challenge in terms of the people process across the enterprise and how can internal audit be helpful here. Um, you know, you've got potential leaders of organizations and departments if people spend a stint in their career in the internal audit function and see and know how that process and function operates, it can make them better performers across the board in addition to, um, you know, just the, the role that they would play there. Process, process is one of the biggest areas for internal audit and to try to make processes more efficient, more effective, um, communications, technology, 
um, utilization of technology and can we be better and more efficient? Can we, you know, we put in all these tools, but are we using the tools to the, the fullest extent possible to really leverage what the tools can do for us? So Janice, I know you've also got some comments on this page. Yes, thanks, Alison. And, you know, similar to, to what you have mentioned and talked about and going back to the earlier discussions, a company stage in the risk maturity can also really just drive and shape these elements. Um, having the appropriate structure, people, and process involved can really help drive and shape the internal internal audit strategy. Um, and as you mentioned, utilizing technology to gain efficiency, but also minimizing risk um, with its benefits as well. So, um, and thank you for addressing this wheel. I do have a question for you, Alison, just in terms of kind of um, final thoughts for this webinar. Is that you know what elements would you consider key to having a successful transition to establish an internal audit function? Um, be interested in just getting your thoughts and sharing that with the audience here. Thanks, Janice, for that. I think, I mean, one of the, to me, one of the very most important uh, things to have in place to establish an in appropriate internal audit and effective internal audit function is, is the right tone from the top. So you want your audit committee, your board, your senior leadership, your CEO and CFO to understand the value and the importance of what the internal audit function can bring and can do to the organization and really to be supportive of that um, and really to want to foster an organization where um, it operates efficiently and effectively and people aren't afraid to speak up if there are issues of that kind of thing. I mean, whistleblower is a really important thing, for example, where people should be able to, if they see something going on, you know, speak up, say something, you know, submit, you know, either anonymously or through typical business channels. And if an organization, you know, doesn't want that information shared and doesn't want it to get out and doesn't want to take those questions or those, you know, challenges, it really creates risk for an organization. And, and there are studies that have shown that effective tone from the top, you know, in the long run will make an organization more efficient, more effective, more profitable, uh, which, you know, often resonates. So, so I think tone from the top is, is absolute imperative. If you don't have the support and the sponsorship from the, the business leaders, it, it's going to be a struggle and a battle to get your function up and running. You may have the best you know, ideas in the world, but you, you really need the support of, of the leadership team and the board and the audit committee to, to really make that happen most effectively. Great. Folks in the audience may also have thoughts on that as well. Put them in the chat if you do. <laughs> yes, well, thank you, Alison, for your thoughts on that. Um, I would say I think this wraps up our webinar for today. Um, going to share this. So thank you all for your time and participating in this webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us um, and have a great rest of the day.